All right, well, thank you for the invitation to speak at the Canola Discovery Forum. I'm Tim Dumonceau, and I work at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a project that just wrapped up. It's, uh, the project is called Canola Frequency Effects on Nutrient Turnover and Root Microbe Interactions. And before I begin, I think it's really important to acknowledge my colleagues, two of whom are bolded, uh, two of whose names are bolded here on the, on the introductory slide. Really, this project was the intellectual work of Bobby Helgeson, who conceived the project, and of Jennifer Town, who did a lot of the work and a lot of the data analysis. So I really wanted to acknowledge that right up front. And of course, the work wouldn't have happened without my colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan, Melissa Arcan, Stephen Siciliano, and another colleague at, uh, at, the, at uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Brianne Tildeman. Tildeman. So I'd like to begin by pointing out that um, multicellular plants, as well as animals, but we're talking about plants here, really live and actually evolved in a world that's dominated by microbial life. And this microbial life has been part and parcel of plants throughout their evolutionary history, going back to two independent events that happened 1.5 billion and about 1 billion years ago, when plant cells became uh, what we would modern, in modern day recognize as plant cells through two separate endosymbiotic events. These um, microbial cells that were engulfed by these uh, early cells actually formed what are now called plant cells by becoming the chlor chloroplast and mitochondria. So these cellular organelles that form part of how we would define a plant today. And throughout those eons of evolutionary time that have elapsed between those endosymbiotic events and today, plants have developed many complex and, and important interactions with the microbial life that they find all around them. This, these interactions are important enough that we're coming to view a plant as, um, as more than just a plant cells or a collection of plant cells and plant tissue, but as this concept of something we call a holobiont, where a plant consists of more than just its plant cells. We have a whole range of bacterial and fungal species that associate very intimately with the plant. And of course, we see some of these interactions as being negative in terms of disease expression, but in many cases, these interactions confer positive or beneficial traits to the plants. And these interactions can be epiphytic or on the outside of the, of the plant cell, or they can even be endophytic, existing within and between the plant cells. And if we think about this in terms of the composition of the, the microbial species that associate with plants, it's really a two-way interaction. We can consider the, the entire complement of the microbial cells that associate with plants as really a second genome conferring a wide range of phenotypic traits, many of which are beneficial onto the plant. And in, 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 um, in complementarity to this, the host plant itself affects that composition of the, of the uh, bacterial, fungal, and other microbial uh, microbiota that associate with by excreting things like uh, compounds from its roots that will affect which, um, which microbial species actually associate with the plant. So we have to think of the, the plant in, in, in terms of its total genomic and genetic context, which includes the microbial species that associate with it. And of course, the current project is focused on the microbiota that's associated with the below ground or the, the soil uh, microbiota. And we know that root systems are critical for, for plant health. And in fact, it's so important that there's an, an old idea going all the way back to Charles Darwin, but seeing increasing um, uh, uh, application there or acceptance these days, that the plant is really functionally analogous to an animal brain. And whether or not you believe that, that the, that the root system is, uh, is uh, responsible for sensing and communication and so forth, we do know that the roots are critical for water and nutrient acquisition, and also for the recruitment of the soil microorganisms, so the actual organisms that associate with the roots. And in this particular project, we're talking about three critical compartments. The bulk soil, which is kind of loosely defined because it depends very much on depth and nearness to the plants and so forth, but basically the soil away from the plant. The rhizosphere, which is that area of the soil that's immediately adjacent to the root within maybe a few millimeters, and then the roots themselves. These are the, are, are the, the three key compartments that are, are, are um, under study in this particular project. So what does all this biology have to do with current agronomic practices? Well, we know that crop rotation is a strategy that's used by producers to increase soil and plant health. And we know that the rotation strategies really are, are up to the producers quite reasonably, but they're informed by more than just biological considerations. We have economic and social and pragmatic considerations that will inform producers' choice with respect to crop rotation. 
And, and we know that, um, that, that one rotation that's, that's seeing increasing um, application is short rotation uh, canola, even going all the way to the old canola snow rotation or continuous canola. So the impacts of these kinds of uh, rotational choices can be obvious in terms of disease, thinking of, of club root in particular, but also things like sclerotinia, black leg, and so forth. But the, these effects can also be more subtle and can be reflected in the nutrient availability or the nutrient turnover, and also the composition of the soil microorganisms that associate with these plants. So in terms of context for the particular study that I'm talking about today, we were able to leverage the efforts of an already established um, uh, study that had been going on uh, between the years 2008 and 2019, which was a long-term crop rotation study uh, at five locations throughout Saskatchewan and Alberta. And in that study, um, the, uh, the goal was to examine the responses of Liberty Link and Roundup Ready canola in these three different rotational strategies. So straight canola for all 12 years, canola alternating with wheat, canola rotating with pea, rotating with barley. So these three rotational strategies. And we were able to gain access to a subset of these samples or these plots um, and from three of the five locations in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, and Scott, Saskatchewan, and Lacombe, Alberta, representing a variety of soil types. And we were, uh, came into this project at the very end of this uh, long-term rotational study, years 11 and 12, so these rotations were very well established. And we were always looking at the canola year of these, uh, of these uh, crop rotations. So in terms of objectives, we had uh, four key objectives. So we have three geographic areas to examine. We have three different rotational strategies. And our first objective here was to examine the impact of these rotational strategies on the nutrient fluxes that the plants are observing. So what nutrients are flowing through the soil that the roots may have access to at their flowering stage. So we could look at important soil nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and so on and so forth. The second important objective for us was to examine how rotation, how these rotational strategies impact the soil and root and rhizosphere microbiomes. So what, uh, how do the bacteria and fungi associated with these plants respond to these different uh, rotational strategies? And the third objective was to examine the plant half of that equation. So to take a look at the, the short, the, the, uh, the, the small organic acids that are produced by the by the plants themselves, so things like formate and tartrate that you see here, how do they, how are the, 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 um, the um, composition of these root exudates affected by these rotational strategies? And these three objectives have been complete with the completion of the project at the end of the September. And objective four was to sort of tie it all together and determine how this resource availability links to the canola microbiome and the, and the uh, nutrient availability. That, I will give you a brief overview of these results and also, um, I uh, want to point out that it's still ongoing because the project has just ended, so we're starting to uh, get a sense of these linkages, and I'll just give you a taste of some of the results that we observed. Okay, so in terms of how we're doing this, we're looking at the nutrients and exudates in particular. So to look at the soil nutrients that are flowing through around the time of, of flowering that are available to the root systems, we use these plant root simulator probes that are commercially available. And essentially we took the plots and we installed these uh, root simulator probes right immediately adjacent to the plants and they contain these exchange uh, uh, membranes. And exchange, we exchanged them a couple of times and we looked at a six week period around flowering which allowed us to examine all the nutrients you see on the screen there from oxidized and reduced nitrogen in the form of nitrate and ammonia, phosphorus, potassium, all of these important nutrients were able to be analyzed in that critical period around flowering. As far as the exudates, so the compounds, these organic acids that are produced by the plants that uh, can shape the composition and structure of the microbial uh, communities in the, in the roots, we collected three or four plants right at the flowering period and we took the roots and whatever adhering soil, uh, washed it in buffer and identified and quantified the different organic acids at the University of Saskatchewan using iron, chromato iron chromatography. As far as the microbiome, how do we examine the microbiome associated with the root systems in these, in these uh, samples? Well, to give you a sense of the challenge that we face, I'm showing here a picture of a single bacterial cell, in this case E. coli, that's been very gently lysed and you can see all of the stringy mess of DNA that's associated with this one bacterial cell. And you can imagine extrapolating this to a gram of soil where you might have a hundred million to a billion different uh, cells of, from different microbial species, including bacteria and fungi, 
And not all of that DNA is equally informative as to the origin of the, um, or the identity of the uh, microbial species from which it was derived. So in order to overcome this challenge, we use a process called the polymerase chain reaction, which essentially is just a cycling of temperatures around these three, um, these three temperatures. And what it results in is an enrichment of that DNA sample for uh, microbial sequences that are informative as to the, uh, the species from which it was determined. So we have to do this two separate times. We do one polymerase chain reaction to generate a sequence um, uh, identified as 16S from the ribosome, uh, from ribosomal RNA that, that identifies bacteria, and another sequence that we can enrich for, which is from the internal transcribed spacer ITS sequence, which helps us to identify the fungal species that are associated with these samples. And then we take these samples that are enriched with the, for the DNA and we sequence them on this instrument I've shown here called the MySeq. And what this, what this instrument will do is take these, uh, these sequences that we've enriched and it will generate millions of sequences over the course of uh, several days. And the, we, we can, the sequences that are thereby generated can be used to identify the microbial species from which they're derived by comparison to databases. And it also give us, gives us a sense of the species composition and the structure of the communities that are present. So what do we observe? In terms of the nutrient fluxes, so this is the, the information that we got out of, the, um, out of the plant root simulator probes. Really, we didn't see a tremendous effect of crop rotation in terms of nutrient availability for these plants. Um, the strongest effect we saw at, was at Swift Current, and, and we think the reason we didn't see a strong effect is because these were all fertilized plots and they were fertilized according to soil testing standard agronomic practices. But what you see here is a way that we can express these differences. This is just a mathematical way of expressing the differences where the groups that you see in green and blue and red correspond to the different treatments. And the similarities are reflected in terms of clustering or, or these points being close together. And what you see here is that basically they're all quite similar, although the canola alone plots have a slightly different um, structure in terms of the nutrient uh, fluxes going, that are available to the roots. Principally what we see with continuous canola at swift current is an increase in things like potassium, sulfur, magnesium, and calcium, and so on, but not a very strong effect on, on the nutrient fluxes. In terms of the root exudates, so the things that the plants are producing, those organic acids that shape the structure of the microbial community, we saw these kinds of differences where you can start to see these red squares differentiate from the red squares corresponding to straight canola differentiating from the, the rotational strategies. You can see them being somewhat separate here. So we do see some differences in the root exudate profiles without getting into great details. The plants are responding differently to the rotational strategy, at least at these two locations. In terms of the microbiota, I can only give you a very brief overview and I won't even show you the bacterial data because the, really the key takeaway here is that the fungal community was much more affected by this, the rotational strategy or the rotation frequency compared to the bacterial community. We observed this at all sites, all sample types in both years. And just give, to give you a, a brief overview of a couple of examples of this, we look at a fungus identified as alter, Alternaria alternata associated with the soil and rhizosphere. And this is an organism that's been associated with, um, with plant disease in terms of leaf spot diseases, also with commodity spoilage, post-harvest and so forth. And we can see a significant increase, particularly in the rhizosphere here at Scott, under the conditions of continuous canola compared to the rotational conditions. So these organisms that are associated with sort of negative outcomes can be, in, can be increased in, a, in a, a straight canola kind of a rotation. On the other side of the coin, if we look at organisms that can be viewed as beneficial, here's a, an organism identified in the genus Penicillium, which is associated with beneficial traits of phosphorus metabolism and so forth. We do see uh, significant increases, particularly in the rhizosphere, so that area that's right adjacent to the roots, um, especially at Scott and Swift Current with the most complex rotational strategy that we that we tested, which was the canola pea barley. We also observed this in the bulk soil. So we do see these organisms that are responding um, to the, these rotational strategies, possibly in response to the exudates that are being produced by the plants. Another um, organism that was impossible to miss when looking at the fungal um, uh, microbiota data was an organism that the computer identified as Olpidium brassicae. This, this sequence was, was found in all, all sites and it was very abundant. It was really hard to miss. And I'll just point out a, kind of an interesting observation here. We had two sequences, two of these different, what are called ITS sequences that identify the fungi. 
um, that we found in the, in the uh, fungal libraries. One was one codenamed F509, which we observed only at Lacombe, and another one was called D3F1. Both of them look like Olpidium brassicae, and they're both very similar to one another across about 250 nucleotides of sequence. They only differed at four places. But yet, despite this real similarity at, um, in terms of their, um, their taxonomic identity and the sequence that was observed, we see a significant difference in terms of their response to uh, canola rotational strategies. So if we look at this F509 sequence, for example, that was uh, found only at Lacombe, we see a significant enrichment of that particular sequence under straight canola compared to the rotational strategies in all three compartments, in the root, in the rhizosphere, and in the soil. And this other sequence, this D3F1, which is very similar in terms of its uh, actual sequence, was not affected by the rotational strategies. So this is something that's important to follow up on. These two organisms, all we know about them is their ITS sequences, and yet they respond very differently to um, the rotational strategies. So to conclude, uh, we observed that the, the long-term or the short-term uh, short rotation canola um, has a really kind of transient and site-dependent effects on the, um, on the nutrient availability to the roots. And this was not really a surprising observation given that we, there was rotation-specific fertilizer regimes according to current uh, agronomic practices, just indicating that these soil test-based fertilization uh, regimes really gives adequate nutrients, which is not hardly a surprise. Secondly, the canola rotation strategy had a stronger effect on the soil fungal biome compared to the bacterial microbiota. So we consistently saw effects on the fungal uh, microbiome compared to the bacterial microbiome across all sites and at all compartments. As I showed you very briefly in a couple of examples of, rotation did affect the abundance of particular fungal taxa. And that effect was greatest in the bulk soil and in the rhizosphere, more so than in the roots themselves. And finally, I want to emphasize that continuous canola resulted in the dominance of this uh, fungal uh, species identified as Olpidium brassicae, particularly this one sequence variant. And Olpidium brassicae is really a rather poorly understood root colonizer, but overall its life cycle is kind of similar to the club root pathogen. So that's something that, uh, that could be very important. We found this organism present at all root sites and was especially dominant as that one uh, sequence variant in short rotation canola. This we feel is a, a, a very valid direction for future study. Where do we go with this? One of the advantages of doing this kind of work is it can lead you down roads you would have no uh, reason to go down before. So doing these kinds of um, high throughput sequencing can, can bring you to hypotheses that you might not otherwise have the, the ability to generate. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, hopefully I'll be available for questions.